Welcome to Shooting Straight. I'm your host, Ken Buck. In today's highly partisan environment, political adversaries often minimize each other's arguments by labeling motives rather than engaging in constructive dialogue. For the next 30 minutes, I invite you to join me as we cut through the political noise and learn about what inspires our guest and how the frontier spirit she inherited from her family has influenced her life in public service. Today, we will explore her work in the state of Wyoming, then as a representative in the U.S. House of Representatives, and now as United States Senator, and what lessons she has learned from the Western frontier. It is my pleasure to welcome Senator Cynthia Lummis of Wyoming to the show. Are you ready to start shooting straight? <laughs> I am, my old friend Ken Buck. <laughs> I was just going to start with that, actually. We have known each other for years. We were law school classmates. Um, I had the, the great honor of uh, living in Wyoming for a period of time and just love uh, Wyoming and rural America uh, uh, more generally. But uh, tell me, what, what does it mean? What is the frontier and, and, and what does it mean to you? Well, since my family has been in Wyoming for many generations, uh, Wyoming is very much home. It's in my blood. It's in my heart. Uh, it just means the world to me. My great-grandfather came to what is now Wyoming when it was a territory. And uh, he was on a Union Pacific train between Cheyenne and Laramie. Terrible snowstorm. Uh, he helped dig the train out, backed it into Cheyenne, Wyoming, and he never left. Uh, he founded a hardware store in Cheyenne, uh, went up to the Black Hills to look for gold, was successful in finding some gold. On his way back, he ran into the uh, scouting party returning from the Custer Massacre. Uh, to tell the forts along the way what had happened. So that puts in context the life he lived. Uh, went back to Cheyenne and founded a hardware store. That's neat. And what happened? Uh, how, did, how did you go from, or your family go from the hardware store to uh, ranching? Well, my gr great grandfather's hardware partner had a ranch. So when my great grandfather bought him out of the hardware store, he also bought the ranch. He didn't have any clue how to ranch. Uh, so his new son-in-law, who had just returned from the trenches in France in World War I, wanted to try his hand at ranching. And so my great-grandfather let him, and uh, my grandfather, Doran Lummis, uh, was, uh, was that rancher, and I was raised there. My dad was raised there, and uh, multiple generations are still on that ranch. How would you describe uh, the frontier spirit, the spirit in, in rural America? Well, it really is a place of wide open spaces. Uh, and because we're naturally socially distant, uh, we communicate by looking each other in the eye uh, and handshakes still matter. Uh, short sentences and uh, meaning what you say and saying what you mean and doing what you say you're going to do uh, is still the way of the West. In fact, Wyoming may be the only state in the union that has a state code of the West. Uh, it's a code of ethics uh, that drives our state's residents, uh, and it's literally in statute. Interesting. So how do women fit into the Code of the West? Mm. Well, Wyoming is the first government in the world to continuously grant women the right to vote. This happened in 1869. Uh, women received the right to vote when Wyoming was a territory. The first woman voter was Louisa Swain. She voted in 1870. Now, that was a full 50 years before the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution granted all women the right to vote. So we had the first everything when it came to women. First woman governor, first woman all city council, first woman mayors, first women delegates to the Republican and Democrat national conventions, uh, the first statewide elected woman. In fact, uh, Estelle Real, who was the first woman uh, elected to statewide office in the country, uh, was accused of using her looks uh, as bait to get people to elect her to office. And the men thought that was really unfair. She was a very handsome woman. But it worked. It worked. <laughs> and she was a great superintendent. And of course, uh, our first woman governor, 
uh, eventually became the first woman head of the United States Mint. Uh, and there were a lot of firsts in among Wyoming women. Well, let's not be too humble. You're a first also. I am, and I'm sorry that it took us so long, but I am the first woman from Wyoming to serve in the United States Senate, and it's such an honor. I, I It's an indescribable honor because I was born in Wyoming. I was educated in Cheyenne schools, both Trinity Lutheran School and public schools later. I'm a graduate of the University of Wyoming three times over. Uh, my, my dad told all of us kids, uh, you can go anywhere you want to college as long as it's within the borders of the state of Wyoming. So I'm a graduate of the University of Wyoming in animal science, biology, and then eventually went back to law school there with you mm -hmm. uh, and lived my whole life there. And I choose to be there over any place else in the world. Uh, because I can't wipe the smile off my face when I'm there because it just feels like it's part of me. Uh, there are some people that relate to other human beings or they relate to um, something other than a place. And for me, my closest relationships are with place. Uh, so, for example, I'll be driving long distances in Wyoming and I'll see this magnificent landscape and I'll I'll be alone, and yet I find myself smiling. I can't wipe the smile off my face because my eyes are drinking in the absolute majesty and solace of this place. It's just truly spectacular. I, I remember, Cynthia, when I was in Wyoming, people would drive five or six hours for a steak, for a, yes. for a, a malt. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it just blew me away, and yet when I did it, I got it yeah. because it's the driving is just something that is so enjoyable with the, the beauty that you're surrounded with. With. We call, And we call it windshield time for a reason, because when you're by yourself behind a windshield and you're surrounded by this magnificent landscape uh, and you're seeing uh, antelope and wild horses and moose and deer and elk uh, and, and beautiful forests or magnificent rivers, skies that go on endlessly, uh, it allows your mind uh, to drift or think, and windshield time is a time when people in Wyoming are driving for miles and they're thinking about their lives, the world around them, their values. They may be thinking about a problem that they solve along the way. Windshield time is important time to people in Wyoming. It's not like being stuck in a traffic jam uh, and being frustrated. It, it, it's the time that you let your mind uh, relax or work on a problem, and it's important time to us. Yeah, I, I can't believe it. I, I think I know you better than um, anybody in this town in DC knows you. Um, and yet uh, I was uh, reading some material before uh, this chance to talk to you, and it was the New York Times that told me a new story <laughs> about you. And I couldn't believe of all the uh, newspapers, it would be the New York Times. But uh, tell us about a bull named Romeo. And, and first of all, what a great name for a breeding bull. And, and uh, who, who named Romeo? <laughs> well, I bought Romeo at the National Western Stock Show in, in Denver. Uh, and he was raised and uh, shown at these fabulous livestock shows uh, by a couple of young women. And he loved those girls. And I bought him and he loved me. He loved women, whether it was human women or bovine women. <laughs> and he... Um, uh, he was just a delight to be with. Um, I would be out in a huge pasture, hundreds of acres, and he would see me and he'd come run, running at me uh, out of just sheer joy. And it, it, he'd get closer and closer running really fast and I'd get scared that he was going to, you know, knock me over. Uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was a joyous relationship that the two of us had. Uh, and uh, he was one of my very best friends. And uh, the, the story goes that uh, he had uh, foot rot. And he, he did. He did. He had a, 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 a fungus on his feet that were making it very hard to walk. Uh, and so I went out in this pasture. Alone. Alone with a stock trailer, haltered him, and, uh, 
and he let me just lead him into the stock trailer. I drove him to an Albertson's grocery store parking lot in town, met the veterinarian. We had to unload him because you can't uh, treat livestock in the dark in a trailer. Uh, so we unloaded him in the grocery store parking lot. Uh, he got his shot. I put him back in the trailer and then put him back with the cows, and he was fine. Uh, but that's the kind of things that happen in Wyoming every day. This was not unusual, uh, but I think it is unusual for people uh, who live elsewhere in the country. It's hard to imagine this kind of a lifestyle in America in the century we're in. Yeah. You talked a little bit about your, your past. Um, I wanted to talk, you mentioned Trinity Lutheran School. Um, I think it was really something that had an impact on you, all the different things you did at that school and, and the folks that you knew. Tell, tell us about that. Well, I was horribly shy, indescribably shy, truly miserable to be around other people. Uh, so at Trinity Lutheran School for uh, the first eight years I was schooled, uh, I was in very small classrooms and uh, with people with whom I was familiar. I also went to church at that church, and my 4-H club was at that church. It was the T Bar L 4-H club for Trinity Lutheran. So I, I had a very comfortable, nurtured youth for someone who was as shy as I was. That was really important. And this school still exists today. Uh, this school was founded in the 1890s. My grandmother, went to this school. She was born when Wyoming was a territory in Wyoming. So this is a school of longstanding that's gone through our family. And even my great nephew, who is stationed here in Washington, D.C. with the U.S. Marine Corps, went to that little school. So it's a marvelous uh, part of Cheyenne's history and certainly uh, has been influential on everyone in my family for many generations. How, how would you describe your values uh, that, that you learned from growing up with uh, the Trinity Lutheran and the, the history in Wyoming and the windshield time? What, what, what does that teach you? Well, I'm very well grounded. I'm one of those person who very much identifies with place. I have a strong sense of place. And I have a strong sense of loyalty uh, to uh, take care of the things that I'm around because I learned to love and appreciate them so much. So whether it's livestock or land or air or water, uh, I want it to be uh, clean and cared for. Uh, and I, I it, it, it's just a strong sense of loyalty specifically uh, to the natural beauty around me. In my sense in Wyoming um, is there is sort of this rugged individualism. There is this, this um, I can do this, and, and if I can't do it, a neighbor will help me do it. But uh, there, there is a, a special sense of can-do optimism in, in, a, in a place like uh, Wyoming. Very special. And even though we have very rugged individuals, uh, we also, within small communities, in, especially in agriculture, uh, the community is very much the ranches around you. So if you're having a branding uh, one weekend, uh, the neighbors come and help. Uh, they bring food or they bring their horses and their ropes and they help uh, brand that day. There's a big community meal. And then next weekend, everybody goes to somebody else's place to help them brand. So it creates community and a sense of belonging in that area for the people. It gets the work done quickly and efficiently. Uh, and it, it, it makes people appreciate uh, the challenges around them and the people who help them meet those challenges. What does agriculture mean to you? Hmm. Well, to me, agriculture uh, is, uh, it's almost like the root word of agriculture is culture. So you're taking care of something that is ag-related, uh, growing food, producing livestock, um, taking care, whether it's flowers, like, whether it's horticulture or agriculture. Uh, the key word to me in that is culture. And the culture is a culture of stewardship, of care, of nurturing, uh, of obligation, of responsibility, 
Uh, and so you see that in communities that are agriculture oriented. The people in agriculture are on the school boards. They're on the conservation district boards. They're in the state legislature. They're in the Congress. Uh, they are the mayors and, and the uh, founding mothers and fathers of communities and the people who keep them going. And it's because that agriculture, uh, the culture of it, uh, is is so deeply embodied in these people uh, that it goes with them everywhere. It goes with them to town, to church, to work, uh, and uh, um, it, it, it's rural America. There's something unique about being close to the ground, though. There's something unique about seeing things grow and and uh, in the spring and die in the fall, and and the the life cycle that you are part of is isn't something a lot of people can relate to. A lot of Americans think that food is on the grocery shelf wrapped in cellophane, and they don't really understand the the work that goes into uh, agriculture um, or, or the the lifestyle. You know, Ken, one time on the floor of the U.S. House, uh, I was talking about this very subject. And I, I said this, even though I knew it might be kind of embarrassing. I said, honestly, I have stood in a field that I was irrigating late in the day when the sun is setting and it's very quiet and all you can hear is meadowlarks, but you can hear the grass grow. You can hear the grass grow. And I meant you could hear it. And two people in Congress came up to me later. I think one of them was Bruce Westerman and said, I've heard it. I know exactly what you're talking about. You can hear the grass grow. But it's not something that most people are in a place to listen to. Uh, but for, I'm very blessed. I have been in that place. Uh, and, and once you can hear the grass grow and your senses are just totally heightened because you're out in this field where you can smell, you know, the water and the grass and the moisture in the air, and you can see uh, all this beauty around you, the spectacular sky, and you can hear the sounds of the meadowlarks and, and the grass growing, uh, it it makes you feel part of it. Uh, and once you feel part of that, you can't separate yourself from it because it's inside your head after that. It's inside your soul. Interesting. So uh, you take these values that you have, multi-generational values, and you decide to run for, for public office. What drew you to public service? Well, my dad was a county commissioner and I was the messy eater among the four kids in my house. So uh, I had to sit next to my dad at the dinner table, and he was supposed to help me learn how to eat less messily. But because of that, we kind of became extremely close about our, our interests. I was completely fascinated by his work as a county commissioner and later on the tax commission, the Board of Agriculture. Uh, and, uh, and so later, when I was a student at the University of Wyoming in animal science, I needed some uh, credits in humanities. Uh, and so I served as an intern at the Wyoming legislature when I was a senior, second semester senior at UW. For the first time in my life, I'm at the Wyoming legislature. And I fell in love with it, fell in love. I was excited by the issues and the people. And so just a short time later, when I was still really young, uh, I- No, 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 not still really young. You were the youngest <laughs> ever elected to the Wyoming State House. Yeah, I was 23 when I filed, 24 when I started serving. And I, I just never looked back. It was just something that grabbed me. Uh, so uh, I, I even went back to law school, which is where I met you. Uh, and uh, it, it has been a huge part of my life. So you, you were in the Wyoming State House, um, and you take a little time off mm -hmm. um, from public life. And then you uh, become the Wyoming State Treasurer. Uh, tell us about that experience. When I was a legislator, uh, I saw that we were taking minerals out of the ground uh, and uh, converting them to tax revenue. Some of that tax revenue needed to be saved because those minerals are not going to last forever. Uh, 
So we were converting some of that, the minerals to cash and then the cash to savings. And I became fascinated with how to invest that money so it would accrue benefits for many generations. And so when I became state treasurer, I got to take that portfolio from almost no equities. It was almost all fixed income investments. And I got to take it when I, eight years uh, as state treasurer, when I left, we had 55% equities and 45% fixed income in a fully diversified asset allocation. And that asset allocation grew those funds uh, from $4.4 billion when I took office to $8.4 billion when I left. Well, fortunately, that set the stage for uh, additional um, investments uh, and more oil and gas to be converted to investments that are continuing to be invested uh, so that now those funds are over $20 billion and growing. And uh, it's an important source of revenue for Wyoming's general fund. So as legislators in, in Wyoming uh, are grappling with uh, the loss of revenue from oil, gas, and coal, uh, in no small part because of federal policy and our decision uh, to reject hydrocarbons as an important source of energy and to turn instead uh, to things like the Green New Deal. Um, I'm so glad that that revenue is there to continue to generate income for the future. It's so fascinating to me because when I hear you talk about it, it's, it's almost like uh, future generations deserve this wealth. The, the, the wealth that is underground, if you take it out of the ground, you're denying future generations uh, uh, an asset, uh, 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 something that, that is of value. And yet what you do is when you take that out and you generate revenue, you then set it aside so that the interest can be used for generations. So it's not just um, a selfish act that one generation benefits from. It's really this act that people that live in Wyoming will uh, enjoy for years to come. That's exactly right. And that is what caused me to become interested in Bitcoin. Because the concept of Bitcoin is you mine Bitcoin. And once you produce it, and it is a finite resource, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever mined. So you know that it's a quantifiable, finite resource, and it has so many of the qualities of gold without being a physical asset that you almost know intuitively it's going to grow in value and that it's a good store of value. So one of the things when I was treasurer is I wanted assets that would produce income for the short term and that would produce long-term value, stable values that uh, would replicate uh, minerals in the ground. Well, that's kind of what Bitcoin is now. And as I struggle horribly with the fact that we're seven, 27 trillion in debt going on 28 trillion, and people have even lost uh, their sense of how much a trillion dollars is, uh, I'm just glad that Bitcoin's out there. So your everyday worker, whether they're putting up hay in Wyoming or building a building uh, in Washington, D.C., the end of the day, they can go invest in Bitcoin or uh, fractions of Bitcoin, and that over time, that value is going to be retained. I can't say that for the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. dollar is being debased because the Congress cannot stop spending, even though it doesn't need to. In this uh, $1.9 trillion bill that we're considering now, if you stack dollar bills up, 1.9 trillion of them, you're halfway to the moon. That's how much money we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, it, it makes no sense. Uh, we've lost all perspective. Uh, and we're not thinking at all about 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, or even farther. I think the, the thing that impresses me about uh, your time in the, in the state legislature and in, in, as state treasurer is that uh, the, the, the work that you do now in the United States Senate and the work that we have done together in the United States House, a lot of people don't understand why it's so offensive to us that we have this debt. 
They just look at debt as a necessary evil to continue the, the story in, in America. And yet, when you come from rural America and when you appreciate rural America, you look at this debt and you think it, it's just so contrary to the values that you develop growing up in, in a place like Wyoming. Many people in agriculture, especially um, whether you're growing crops or, or livestock, you borrow money in the spring uh, to either buy cattle or buy seed uh, or inputs for your crop. And then when you produce this crop in the fall, you pay back your debt. So you begin the next year debt free, and then you do that again. Uh, the notion of becoming debt-free before Christmas uh, is a really common good feeling for people in agriculture. Uh, but in the Congress, as you and I have experienced, we never get to feel that because Democrats like to tax and spend. Republicans like to borrow and spend. And uh, the, the key subset of those two groups is they like to spend. Right. And so... It used to be that we would say, Ken, you and I, uh, we are, are borrowing from our children and our grandchildren. And at $28 trillion in debt, no one is going to pay that back. Our contemporaries aren't. Our kids aren't. Our grandkids are not going to pay that back. We are going to allow the U.S. dollar to become debased, devalued, to buy less over time. Uh, and so one of the things I try to tell people now is, you know, buy something that lasts. If for you that's gold, you know, buy gold for savings. Spend dollars, but have your savings in something that's going to last, whether it's artwork or gold or, in my case, Bitcoin. Um, or land. Or land. Oh, my gosh, yes. They're not making any more land. <laughs> uh, and you can love the land. And it can grow in value as well. So at some point you decide uh, you've, you've been in the Wyoming State House, you've been the Wyoming State Treasurer, uh, you start looking at, at federal office. And, and by the way, how many days a year does the Wyoming State Legislature meet? <laughs> uh, it's 60 days every two years. So uh, in odd numbers year, years, it's 40 days. And even numbered years, it's 20. And, and they get all their work done in that period of time. They pass a budget, they fund the state's needs, uh, and uh, they pass all the legislation they're going to pass. And if it doesn't pass, they can come back next year and look at it next year or the next. But um, it, <laughs> they work hard. They work hard during that time, but they get the job done. And then they go back to the land. They do. Yeah. Uh, it, it just it strikes me the... Uh, the Wyoming State Legislature meets 20 days, one year, and 40 days, another year, and they get more done in that time period than Congress gets meeting for a full year. There's no question about it. Uh, there's not time to do message bills. There's not time to do gotcha legislation. Uh, it, it has to be substantive, serious, productive, and the committees work. Um, in the Wyoming legislature, uh, it works the way that we learned in civics, uh, where bills get assigned to committees, come to the floor, go through three readings, pass or fail. If they pass, they go to the next house and go through the same process. As you know, that, it, that hardly ever happens here. Right. Uh, legislation comes out of the leadership office. We have hours to look at something that is 1,300 pages long, nobody can read it, everybody's frustrated, it's jammed through the day before Christmas Eve, everybody goes home angry, uh, it, it's, it, it's broken. It's broken. But there's there's something about being a citizen legislator, going back to your community, getting feedback for 10 months of the year, 11 months of the year, and then going back to the legislature and serving. And and a lot of times people don't do it for a lifetime. They do it for, you know, two, three, four terms and, and then return to their normal life the way our founders intended. Exactly right. And uh, the when, when it became uh, sort of institutionalized here in Washington and the, a political class developed, 
and this became a career. Uh, I think that uh, the desire to hold on to office began to uh, be more important than the desire to do the right thing or a good thing or the best thing you could possibly do with uh, while you're here and then go home. Uh, so uh, we've really gone astray. We really have. And uh, I, there are people here who want to take it back. Uh, it's going to be a Herculean effort. So you, you get to the U.S. House and you're serving in the House Freedom Caucus and you're the only lady. Uh, and I'm proud to tell you now there are a number of uh, ladies in the, uh, I shouldn't say ladies, female legislators, mm -hmm. um, uh, congresswomen in the House Freedom Caucus. Uh, what was it like to, to be in the, in the U.S. House and, and, and also be in the Freedom Caucus? The Freedom Caucus uh, needed to exist to pull uh, the... Um, the entire Congress, but certainly the Republicans farther to the right, to remind them uh, that the money that we spend is going to be borne by people uh, that are not serving now, uh, to remind people uh, that the laws that we pass cannot be uh, so watered down that they're meaningless, or that passing legislation that's a gotcha is a good thing. And I was so proud to serve with uh, the members that I got to serve with. And, and it, it, what's really fun now is you look at where so many of those people are. Ron DeSantis is the governor of Florida. Um, Mark Meadows was White House Chief of Staff. So was Mick Mulvaney, White House Chief of Staff and head of OMB. Um, and the list goes on. I mean, my gosh, you're uh, a, an author. Uh, and uh, and and serving in in the U.S. House and and I get the privilege of serving in the Senate now. We're we're fanning out uh, and sharing the same values. Uh, and oh my gosh, Jim Bridenstine was the head of NASA. Right. Uh, fascinating uh, to have been with those people at the beginning. You were there at the beginning, like I was. Uh, and now seeing where these people are going and sharing those same values wherever they go. It's just, it was an honor to serve with that group. Uh, and the fact that the group still exists, it's very strong. Uh, there are more women in it now than ever. There's a lot of diversity diversity in that group of people from all over the country. Uh, I'm reassured that uh, the Freedom Caucus is truly an asset uh, to the Republican Party uh, nationwide and to the Republican Conference uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives. I want to talk about a few issues that I think are near and dear uh, to your heart and, and just ask how your uh, life experiences, um, both in, in public life, uh, but also in agriculture and, and uh, being from the West, have, have affected those. One, uh, taxes. Well, we uh, in Wyoming have very low taxes. We love it that way because uh, we think that among the most creative things that people do is the way they spend their money. And when you get to keep more of your money, uh, you're more apt to start a side business. Uh, Wyoming has is number one in the nation in terms of people that work multiple jobs and have multiple businesses. Part of it's because Wyoming's a hard place to learn a live, earn a living. But the other part is people there tend to be very entrepreneurial within their community. So maybe it's a small sideline, but when we have more of our money personally, we're able to be creative and innovative in the ways that we use it to help our, our families and our communities, our churches and our, our institutions. Um, if more of that money is being taken away from you, uh, you become more dependent on government to provide the things that you don't have the money left in your pocket to innovate with. Uh, and so I see people that uh, live in cities, uh, they want more services from government, and they expect more services from government because they no longer have the discretionary income left uh, to innovate. Uh, so I think that that's part of the rural attitude is the ability to innovate with our own money. 
and use it in ways that benefit our communities by our decision. I want to give my money to the local volunteer fire department. Why? Because my ranch has a tendency to get lightning strikes often. Uh, and so I want to be, I want to put my money where uh, my personal values are. And one of them is in protecting that land from lightning fires. Let's talk about public lands. Uh, big issues in, in the West with forest fires and uh, the federal government owns what percentage of, of Wyoming land? Half. 50% and, and uh, a little less in Colorado, but but a similar large percentage. I think it's about a third in, in Colorado. And so uh, we we care deeply about the land. Um, you, you, a beautiful description of agriculture. And, uh, and yet uh, bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. make decisions that are so important concerning the land. How, how do you view uh, public land management? Well, sadly, I think people in Washington think of uh, federal land being in a block, private land being in a block, uh, and uh, they can manage this, and private people can manage this, and they're not intertwined. They're completely intertwined. Uh, it's, a, it's like a checkerboard. Uh, there's some land uh, that's private that is surrounded by public land. There's some land that's public that's surrounded by private. Uh, and it's that way all over our states. So uh, the way that the federal government manages its land affects me and vice versa. So if you have people th that love that land so much because it went through multiple generations before it got to you, and you hope it will go through multiple generations uh, going forward, you want to be the very best steward you can. You want to manage it for the long haul. Uh, and uh, the land right next to me uh, is public land. Well, I want the same thing for it because our land is connected and interrelated and interspersed. Um, so uh, if it is allowed uh, to um, grow too dense, uh, and those fragile forests with that minimal topsoil uh, cause an unhealthy forest, uh, those trees are much more susceptible uh, to bark beetle kill or to uh, they're stressed uh, and fires are more apt to take them than in a healthy forest. I could show you forest, Ken, in Colorado, in Wyoming, in South Dakota, uh, where you have a state forest even right next to a national forest. The state forest has had um, conservation thinning. Uh, the national forest has not. And the state forest is so much healthier. You can see it in the greenness of the trees. There are fewer standing dead. There are fewer uh, beetle killed. And, and they're much more resistant to catastrophic fire than an unhealthy forest uh, that has been... Uh, um, uh, just densely compacted. Um, so, <laughs> and then this one just killed me. Uh, when we were having catastrophic fires when I was in the house, uh, I had mentioned uh, how dangerous it was to have all those standing dead. And some of the environmental community that were testifying said, oh, it's not a big deal because as soon as the um, dead needles fall off the trees, uh, you don't have that uh, fire load and they won't be as susceptible to burning. Well, <laughs> last summer we had a massive fire uh, that straddled the Wyoming Colorado border uh, in the Route and Medicine Bow National Forests. Uh, and it was all standing dead that had long since sh uh, shedded their needles, uh, but it was tender dry and it swept through there and burned thousands of acres. Uh, their theories defy logic for those of us who live there. Great. Healthcare. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a personal story, but but uh, start with sort of what is the uh, the view? I mean, I, I always thought of healthcare as my relationship with my doctor. Yeah. And then it's really grown into something much different. Yeah. When we're separated uh, as individuals uh, from paying for our medical bills uh, as we are now because there's an insurance company between us. Um, we don't ask 
how much is this procedure going to cost? The, that's the insurance company's negotiation with the doctor. So we don't pay attention to that. Uh, we just uh, bemoan the cost of our uh, insurance. That has created a situation uh, where there's no transparency in healthcare costs, uh, and uh, we're we're very divorced. Uh, from uh, a line of care. And we might choose something different. Uh, we might look at alternatives if we were comparing uh, costs and outcomes uh, among a variety of providers and courses of treatment, but we don't do that. Yeah. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, can you tell us the story about uh, Al, your uh, deceased husband who, um, how many years were you married? We were married for 31 years. And uh, I was in Congress. Uh, Congress put itself on Obamacare when uh, we passed the, the Affordable Care Act. And so we were both- Right, right thing to do. Yeah, and I, I thought it was absolutely the right thing for Congress to live under the laws it passed. Uh, we've heard for years that people resented Congress exempting itself from the laws it passed. Uh, so the Congress rightfully put itself under Obamacare. So both Al and I were on Obamacare. Um, but he uh, was having some chest pains, went to his doctor, uh, and then um, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, kept saying, well, you're not signed up for this. Well, I had been. And so we went through and straightened it out. The next time he went back, they told him the same thing, you're not on it. Uh, so when the doctor recommended one last test, he said, I, I'm through fighting with the insurance. Uh, I'm not going to have the last test. And uh, a, a few months later, he died in his sleep of a massive heart attack. Uh, and it's the kind of heart attack, it, there's a it's called the widow maker. Unfortunately, you know about the widow maker. I, I know it well, yes. Because you had a heart attack. Um, and... Um, if this test would have revealed that there was uh, a clogged artery, uh, but he didn't have the test because he was tired of fighting with Obamacare. Now, I'm not saying he died of Obamacare. He died of a massive heart attack. But um, when the doctor told my daughter this story shortly after Al died, I had no idea this had all happened. Uh, and But it drove home that... Um, there are consequences to people. They're real lives uh, to um, having policies that are one size fit all and they don't fit all. So uh, allowing people to have a more tailored uh, healthcare system, uh, whether it's health insurance or health providers, uh, alternatives at end of life, uh, alternatives at the beginning of life um, is very important. And uh, I was talking recently to a veterinarian in Wheatland, Wyoming. Uh, he's a sole practitioner, a large animal doctor, and uh, he pays twice as much for his health insurance as a doctor in Sterling, Colorado, your, your district. Right. Uh, and it, it's because of the size of our population, not, not as many people to spread out the costs among. Uh, this system is broken, and it particularly uh, serves rural areas, in fact, frontier areas, very, very poorly. It, it seems to go contrary to one of the strengths that we've been talking about, this, this individualism, this sense of community coming together and, and helping each other, whether it's branding or, or any other project. A barn burns down and neighbors come over and help you put up a barn. And, and, and yet when it comes to health care, for some people, it has to be run out of Washington, D.C. Education has to be run out of Washington, D.C. All these programs, as opposed to trusting the people who are closest to the decision making. And that really is the difference between flyover America and the coasts that I think you just cut to the chase. I think you just identified exactly what that is. Uh, and there's such a divide, such a disconnect between those two ways of thinking uh, that it's having a profound effect on our politics these days. Yeah. So Cynthia, I asked everybody this question. I want to ask you at, at the end of our uh, time here, but uh, if loving this is wrong, I don't want to be right. What is this? <laughs> Oh, it's a great question. 
uh, and I can think of several things, but I've already exposed myself. Um, if loving cows is wrong, <laughs> I don't want to be right. I had this cow named Julia Roberts. My brother named her that because she was the most beautiful cow we had. And her calf's name was Olivia. Olivia Newton-John, also very beautiful. And I was trying to teach Olivia uh, to lead on a halter. And Julia, her mother, was right there. And Julia, because she was a show cow, uh, an elegant show cow. I mean, she strutted like she knew she was the most beautiful cow in the room. And she was. So she would get behind Olivia and butt her so she would uh, learn how to lead. Uh, they're they're much smarter than people know. They're much more affectionate than people know. They're delightful friends. Uh, anybody who's been around them uh, the way I have feels the same way. Uh, and uh, so I'd have to say cows. Well, let me ask you one last question. Last, last question. Uh, did Romeo ever meet uh, uh, Julia? <laughs> Sadly, they were ships that passed in the night. Oh, they never met. <laughs> the, the Hallmark movie that could have been. Indeed. <laughs> I want to thank Senator Lummis for shooting straight with us. And I want to thank you for listening today. I hope this program has been informative, enlightening, and uniting. As Americans struggle with the difficult issues facing our country, we are reminded that good policy is the result of open, thoughtful discussion. God bless you, and remember to always shoot straight.